All right, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, Public Works Committee now will come to order, and we have a general agenda and a consent agenda. Are there any of the consent agenda items that need to be pulled for discussion? C3. C3. Anything else? Is there a motion on the ballots? So, so moved. Uh, discussion? Okay. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? That's approved. And we will go then first to C3, please. Follow up to Linden Street renaming and historic marker commemorating the Blues Street neighborhood. Councilmember Montgomery. Yes, if we could just give a, a brief description of what this is and, and what's going to happen with this. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Margaret Bissett, of course, um, with uh, planning, and I would like to introduce to you all um, the person um, on our staff, a new person on our staff who worked on um, doing the research on um, this item, Desmond Corley. And um, we're very excited to have Desmond um, on our staff. He came, he joined us in November. Um, he is actually originally from Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, um, and he comes to us by way of NC State and Cornell, where he got his planning degree. So, uh, well, but. Desmond, do the presentation here. Good evening, Mr. Chair, other members of the council. Good evening. Um, just try and give a really brief presentation here. This is a timeline of this particular um, project. Goes back to February of last year, I believe, um, when the city began the process of renaming Linden Street to North Research Parkway. Um, in April 2013, the renaming was held before this committee to solicit public input between May and October. Various public meetings were held. Um, and in November, Councilmember Montgomery made a motion with some provisions to the renaming of Linden Street. And between November and this past month, um, planning staff has been doing research with regard to placing a historic marker. Um, commemorating the Baloo Street neighborhood. And in February, the Historic Resources Commission actually approved the draft text that we uh, provided for them. So here's just a little bit of context. Um, it's a little different from the one that you would have gotten with the memo. Um, it actually highlights historic Linden Street and Baloo Street. Those are in purple. I'm not sure how well you can see the cross streets the, that are uh, north-south. But our basic area goes from Baloo Street up to 2nd, and Linden Street is right there in the northwest. This is what it looked like in 1951. This is what it looked like last year. Research Parkway is the blue line. The red arrow shows you Linden Street. And this is the proposed marker text. I don't know if you all want to hear me read that to you. Um, I can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Appreciate the offer. Okay. And this, again, was approved by the um, Historic Resources Commission last month. And then this is our proposed location. The map that went out in the packet is actually wrong as far as the proposed location. This is correct. The one in the packet is too far south. Um, but this is actually along the new part of Research Parkway. Um, so there isn't anything there but street now. But this would be where Baloo Street was in the past. Are there any questions? Really? So the location here is where the proposed, where the mark is supposed to yes. go? Yes. Okay, and that would be where Blues Creek would have, the street would have crossed at that Would point. have crossed, yes. Okay. And I know in the, um, in the packet it stated that there were several individuals that were, were talked with about it, former individuals that lived mm -hmm. in, in the neighborhood. And again, as we were going through this, that was a big part of of reason why this particular stipulation was added to again try to preserve some of that history and text uh, in context of what was happening in this neighborhood. Um, anything um, added besides what is seen on that uh, marker in terms of what came out of some of those conversations with individuals? There were some great anecdotes 
um, some great stories that I could share. I'm not sure how little they are to this particular meeting, but. And, and the reason I ask that is because, um, and, and it's also mentioned that um, Innovation Quarter is, is, it has stated interest of being able to preserve some of history and just even some of those anecdotal stories that were gained may help them in terms of being able to chart out what it is that they want to do to help preserve the history and culture in some of the structures that they have there. So I don't know if we've shared that information or if we're going to share that information, but I would ask that we would try to share that information. Okay. All right. Other questions or comments? With that, I move approval. Second. Discussion? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, no? That's approved. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Corley. <coughs> we'll move now to uh, the first item on the uh, general agenda, please. Resolution adopting a revised honorary street naming policy. And Mr. Turner. Ms. McCullough is going to present this. Ms. McCullough. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Afternoon. Um, the city of Winston-Salem currently installs honorary street name signs as a way of recognizing uh, and honoring individuals, organizations, or entities and events that have significant um, impact and importance in the community. The uh, honorary signs do not change the official street name, but they're installed and they're installed at locations that are that have geographical relationship to the honorary or the event. Um, the first honorary street name sign was installed in 1999, and um, in the seven years that follow, the city has requested at least or sat, the city has received one request per year, with the exception of. 2004. Since 2007, the um, program became more popular, and um, since 1999, we've actually installed 73 temporary honorary signs and 13 permanent honorary street name signs. Uh, the reason that <coughs> we come to you is because in August of 2012, the North Carolina Department of Transportation revisited their policy um, and procedures for naming roads and bridges and ferries. And in accordance with their policy, the local division office can um, actually approve honorary signs and they're only allowed on state roads with the division engineer's approval and these signs must be ground mount mounted and not mounted on overhead span wire like we currently do now. Um, the division engineer um, in our division has asked that we revisit our policy and bring our signs in compliance with their policy, um, which means that we would need to remove the signs from the overhead span wire and make them either ground mounted signs. So this council action is to request um, or to seek authorization for approval from NCDLT for the existing permanent honorary name signs located on state roads and move them to the approved ground mounted locations. It is also to request approval for a revised policy to include the new requirements for state road locations. And uh, I'll take any questions that you have. Uh, Councilor Taylor. Is there an additional cost to ground mount these signs as opposed to hanging them the way they are? The ground mounted signs would probably, the, we can make the same signs unless we determine that we wanted to make them larger. So if we made the signs larger, then of course there would, there would be an increased cost. The existing policy does transfer those costs to the uh, requester. Okay. So, I was wondering. The city does that. So we recoup those costs. So the, the requester does have the ability uh, to remove the sign if they don't want to pay uh, the cost associated with it? The, for the new sign? Yes. I think the, if we were to decide to take the, the existing signs and relocate them, then that would be at our cost. And we did not do a cost estimate, I'm sorry, for this meeting, but we can, we can get that for you. That'd be helpful information to have. Thank you. Councilor Adams. Yes, thank you. Uh, and maybe this should have come earlier uh, before this part of the process, but uh, I think it's great that we honor people by putting up the honorary signs and the temporary signs. I just wish we had plugged a timeline into it such as if you do the honorary, it's for 90 days or whatever. If you do a temporary, it's 30 days. Versus now we, we're getting all of these requests and it's no timeline. I think we need to revisit that, this committee. I really think we need to revisit it. I think the state saw it coming 
and they sit on their state roads. They don't need another sign up there to confuse uh, potential emergency responders and things. I think it's great, but I think we need to understand that I think there's a timeline that needs to be built into this. Councilmember Clark. Yeah, I would certainly uh, second what Ms. Adams just said, and we could certainly do that at another meeting. But I do think we need to revisit in general our sign thing. Number two, I would like a list of the 13 permanent ones. Uh, and number three, I would check with the state to be sure they don't have a, or a requirement on the size. Mm -hmm. I would think most of our street signs, the letters appear to be the same size. If it's a longer word, it's a longer sign. But let's be sure. I, I would be sure that whatever size we have is consistent with a typical street sign, size sign, and check with the state to be sure they don't have a size requirement, min or max, whatever. Mm -hmm. Councilor Montgomery. Um, I think we, in terms of looking at this, I think everybody what's that has been stated is, is good stuff. But I think we do have some timelines on it, but I think we just change it when somebody comes back to us and say, hey, can we leave it up a little while longer? We oftentimes change <coughs> what we have in, in writing to accommodate individuals, and I think that's the piece that we need to come back in and look at. Uh, is this ready for action, or is there a desire to hold it in committee and add additional in? Oh. Okay. If there's no objection, let's hold it uh, and bring it back May. That'd be yeah. fine. And we can bring, we'll bring the whole policy. And you know, right now, the, the mayor has the authority to do one year. Correct. And then if it's more than a year, then it requires council to make it permanent. But we'll bring you the whole policy with the state's changes mm -hmm. and other information of where they are right now. Very good. Thank you. We'll hold this. We'll bring it back to... Uh, to the committee in May. Um, G2, please. Greenway and sidewalk projects update. <coughs> uh, Ms. McCall, you still on? Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Uh, what you have before you is on, on January 14th, the, uh, this committee requested an update to our Greenway and sidewalk projects currently being designed or under construction. So we've listed for you um, the projects that are currently um, in that process, Little Creek Greenway um, is the first project. And in your packet, we give you an update of the projects, but there's also a location map um, for each of the projects, just to give you an idea of where they are. Uh, Little Creek Greenway is a greenway that's um, from Atwood Road north along Little Creek to the shops at Little Creek and a connection to Little Creek Park. Uh, that project is currently under construction. The um, expected completion date is April of this year, and the contract has completed, completed all clearing, and, uh, but, but, but because of the weather, a uh, little activity has occurred recently. Question on that. Um, are they having to redesign that barrel culvert over the uh, main branch of the creek? I may have to defer to Robert Prestwood. Uh, Mr. Prestwood. Uh, no, sir. They're, they're not having to uh, redesign it. It has been submitted to the state for review, um, but it, it was up to the contract, excuse me, the contractor to provide a design for it. I see. Okay, so I, I saw that in, in the update. I wondered right. if we were having to go back on that. Well, that's good news. Thank you very yes. much. Brushy Fort Greenway um, is located between Lowry Street to Reynolds Park Road. Um, it's currently undergoing a flood study for which the contract is being routed for signatures. Uh, at this time, a completion date has not been set. Um, this is also probably for Mr. Presswood. Yes. Um, uh, have we not heard back yet from DOT on that? We received last week from DOT. They've approved all the fees. The contract has been sent to the, uh, the consultant for signatures. Great. Thank you very much. Piedmont Regional Greenway, uh, Linville Road to Hastings Hill Road. Um, NCDOT is requesting permission to complete the design uh, with in-house staff. A completion date has not yet been set. Questions? Go ahead, please. Muddy Creek Greenway connections. Uh, there are two connections, one from Cedar Trail to the Muddy Creek Greenway and the other from Lantern Ridge Drive to the Muddy Creek Greenway. Um, both are about to undergo, undergo a flood study. Uh, the contract is being routed for signatures also. Mr. Clark? Yeah. I'm in good health, but I hope I live long enough to see these 
I would say just a general comment, and I have the next one also, which is Kirkland's Road, that they do seem to take a long time to get through all the processes, and I know, uh, I believe, didn't we petition the state to, to come up with some expediting, expedition type of rule changes? Yes, and that was in our packet again, the legislative packet that we just recommended. That's what I thought, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was described one time, we do about the same engineering we do on a, on a pathway as we do a road. There's a flow chart that explains how it works later on. Yeah, yeah, and, and anyway, please continue as quick as you can. <laughs> <laughs> and item four, we're gonna look at some of the options on, on trying to accelerate that. Please go ahead. Okay, Kirkley's Road Sidewalk and Pedestrian Improvements. Uh, this project is from Friar, I'm sorry, Friar Tuck Road to Schaefer Park <coughs> Park Course Entrance and it includes missing sections on Hertford Road, Saxon Lane to Chester Lane, and a section off of Chester Road, Hertford Road to Peace Haven Road. It's currently uh, being designed. Uh, Pre-construction activities are scheduled to be complete by May of 2014, and construction completed by November of 2014. Thank you. And the uh, last project listed um, are sidewalk projects um, along Allen Street, Burgundy Street, Deborah Lane, Madison Avenue, Watson Avenue. Uh, these projects um, have been submitted to NCDLT for construction for, uh, for consideration, I'm sorry, for a safe routes to school infrastructure grant. Uh, the grant would provide 100% funding for the sidewalks, crosswalks, curb ramps, and other pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, this pro these projects, uh, the state approached us with some additional funds, or leftover funds, safe route to school funds that does not require any matching funds from the city, um, requiring projects that could be completed within a one-year period, um, projects that were already on a list that we could submit to them. So we are um, being told that the funds will be approved um, for us and we should be coming next month with an, um, an item for uh, council's approval to receive those funds. Great, thank you. Many of these in my district. I think one is in yours, Mr. Taylor. Any questions? Two? No questions at all. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Zero mine. Um, that's all the items included. I had one um, uh, question on an item that's, uh, that wasn't included. Um, uh, where do we stand on the analysis of the Southwind uh, Street sidewalk request? Southwind Street sidewalk? Southwind. Request? Um, it, 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 it connects to Country Club Road and Jones. Jonestown Road. I thought we prepared a, a memo um, indicating the cost and a map um, for hadn't, that project. Hadn't seen it. Would love to. I will, I will make sure you receive that information. Thank you. Um, any other questions about the uh, status of the project? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, item three, please. Report on Greenway project priorities. And uh, Ms. McGullough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, at the Public Works Committee meeting on January 14th, um, the committee also requested that we uh, provide information on setting priorities for Greenway projects. Uh, the city's engineering department, along with the planning department and uh, the Department of Transportation, work together to implement um, a new method for evaluating uh, Greenway projects. This new method, um, <coughs> 2012 Greenway Plan update, introduced those new evaluation um, methods and established five tiers of projects. Tiers one and two included priority projects that can be completed within the short term that did not have um, extensive issues involved. Tier, while tier three and five projects uh, were those projects that needed further evaluation um, and assessment. They were more long-range um, projects that were non-traditional greenways. Um, the engineering staff evaluated those, the greenway projects and uh, established a, a list of a number of criteria um, on the feasibility of constructing these greenways, including the availability of right-of-way, terrain, and other obstacles. Uh, these quantitative evaluations were then combined with qualitative um, assessments that we received from the public. 
they were then placed in the five tiers. And the, five, the uh, projects in tiers one and two are listed. Those projects in tier one include the Watown Connector, the Salem Creek Greenway Extension, and the Muddy Creek Greenway Phase Two. Projects in tier two were the Little Creek Greenway Phase Two, Muddy Creek Greenway Phase 5A, and Mill Creek Greenway North Phase One. If you would look in your packet, um, what you have attached would be, um, pardon? on page 27, thank you, would be uh, the list of those projects and with the uh, priority tier listed. And it also gives uh, the connectivity score. The other attachment on uh, sheet 28 would be an overall, page 29, I'm sorry, it would be an overall map uh, showing all of those greenways, but it shows all of the greenways, tiers one through tier five, and they're color coded based upon whichever tier they're in. And at this time, I can answer any questions. And I would just note that I believe all six of these priority projects are included in the discussion draft capital bonds package. Um, Walltown Connector costs in full and uh, matching funds for um, uh, STPDA slash transportation alternatives funding for the other five. Questions? Comments, Mr. Clark. You got the the points there. M maximum of ten. Do I gather from this that if you're not on the list, you have a low score? Uh, no. I'm kind of surprised that one of the ones in tier one has a not picking on whose ward it is a 5.6. Hmm. Yet you got a 7.3 and a 7.1 in tier two. No, sir. It doesn't mean that that ha that it has a low has a much lower score. The connectivity score was. Uh, trying to compile the, um, looking at the qualitative and quantitative uh, scores mm -hmm. from what the community said they wanted as compared to what's buildable, whereas when the final list of uh, projects were uh, placed in Tier 1 or Tier 2, they were uh, evaluated more highly on um, the ability to construct. Yeah, and all those have to come into play. Yes, sir. What, what happened is this, the things that had barriers to um, reality mm -hmm. you know, got dropped out of the, the, the priorities. Uh, and then you, you had a mixture in assignment of, of tier one, tier two, et cetera. Uh, you were including a mixture of the factors of, of the objective uh, connectivity uh, improvement uh, criteria and how much community support there was. Um, the uh, the one of the projects that got 5.6 um, was also the one, if I remember correctly, that had, um, I think, the second highest number of community support turnout at the public hearings. Um, the, the other, the only one that got higher public support ranking was the Muddy Creek. Yes. So, um, and actually, I'm puzzled why that particular project only got a 5.6 and you look at the fact that it, it would, the new trailhead would anchor at Forsyth Tech um, and uh, connect Forsyth Tech to uh, Salem College, West Salem State University uh, and um, School of the Arts. So I wonder if all that got counted. Anyway. But, um, and let's see, um, yeah, no, those, are, those are my only additional information points. Other points? All right. If not, thank you very much for the, um, for the overview. And we'll go to item four, please, which speaks to Mr. Clark's point. Information on future Greenway acceleration options. Mr. Prestwood. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, council members. Good evening. Staff was recently, as recent as just a few minutes ago, asked to look at a way to uh, speed up <laughs> from the announcement of the greenways to the actual construction time of the greenways. Uh, as you're all aware, we rely on NCDOT funding for the majority of this. They supply 80% of it and we supply 20% match. Um, because of this, 
just about every step of the process has to be reviewed and approved by NCPOT. Um, the flowchart was put together so you can see the process we go through currently. Um, we try to use those funds to pay for everything possible um, to get as much bang for the buck, but because of that, um, it adds multiple layers of approvals in there. Um, looking at the flowchart, we came up with a few options to possibly speed the process up. Um, the very first page you have is the process we go through now. The page 33, okay. Then page 34. Page 35. Okay, 35 is a proposed process that would, um, we're proposing that the, the city would pay for any special engineering studies that need to be done. Um, that's the process we're currently going, that we, took many months um, on both of the uh, current greenways where we have to hire a consultant to do a flood study um, to receive the permits we need. This process we're estimating if we were to pay for those engineering studies 100 percent city money we could eliminate one to two months of the process uh, before we reach construction. One thing to remember is even if we're paying for those studies with city money, we still have to follow all the state rules. Any project that has state money in it, um, we have to follow all of their rules and procedures on everything we do. The third flow chart shows the speed increase we feel we could achieve if the city was paying for the engineering studies I talked about but then also the right-of-way acquisition. Um, this makes a very large impact because if we are acquiring the right-of-way with our money, we can go ahead and submit for what's known as a categorical exclusion. It's a, a major permit we have to receive. Um, and that process of that review is a six to seven month process. Um, if we are using state money to acquire the right-of-way, we have to receive that CE before we can even begin acquiring the right away. So that's why there's such a, a speed up in that process. So the seven months of the right away and the one to two months of the engineering studies, we feel like if the city was funding all of that, we could cut eight to nine months from the design process. And then just more as a comparison, the fourth sheet shows the pro what the process would be if we funded Greenways 100%. Um, we did do a calculation on that and feel like if we were paying for Greenways completely with city money, it would cut 12 to 13 months from the design process. Are there any questions? <laughs> I'll start. Um, uh, can you give us some idea of, of the extra city costs that would be incurred with each of those options compared to the overall project price? The, uh, just as an example, the flood studies um, can vary quite a bit depending on what's involved. The contract for Muddy Creek Connections um, was just a little over $100,000 just for the flood study. The contract for um, Brushy Fork um, is around $35,000. So that it can vary, but it, uh, that'll give you an example, you know, something to base that on. The right of way can vary significantly. Um, as new subdivisions are coming in now, we go ahead and make the developers plat right away. Um, but any of these greenways that are going through older neighborhoods or areas, we first ask for donation. Um, typically, have gotten positive responses on the donations, but we usually do run into a few property owners who aren't willing and we do have to acquire the right of way. Um, the most recent projects right of way costs have just been in the ten to twenty thousand dollar which has been fairly small because most people are willing to donate. Um, and how much did you say you would be saving in time uh, for those two? You, uh, Combined we, we estimate eight to nine months. Um, and that's assuming things go smoothly. That's correct. And Brushy Fork, how many years have we been trying to crush it? Mm, mm, mm. Once you involve the railroad, Ooh. it <laughs> complicates things. 
Um, and in the case of Brushy Fork, the total project cost there is, including the section that we haven't yet built, we're trying to get built. I mean, that's pushing, what, 1.2 million? The section we haven't built is, we're estimating right now, 1.1 to 1.2 million. Um, and so the engineering study in that case was 35,000. And we actually did have to pay for at least one section of right away. And how much, what, do you remember how much that was? For this section of Brush Fork, we, we haven't gone through the right-of-way process yet. Okay. For, for phase oh, I'm four. sorry, the, the, yes. the, the, other, the early phase. Yes. Um, but the major property owner in the current section is went to Salem State. That's correct. Backing the project. Um, so uh, a, a one point, looks like uh, a $1.2 million project, we could save as much as most of a year um, with an extra city investment of what's 80% of $35,000. Um, so that would be a good investment there. Um, I'm not sure what it would total in, in well, muddy. Uh -huh. If I could, are we running that on top of that sewer easement out there or under those power lines? Where are we running that? It would. It would not be on top of the sewer easement. It may be running parallel with okay. it. I, w I would have to double I mean, check. You, on know, that. you know, my basic concern is we're spending a hundred thousand dollars on a flood study to build a sidewalk. That's what we're building. It's a little bit wider than a sidewalk, but basically it's a sidewalk. And um, I don't know how to say that bluntly to the folks in Raleigh, but I mean, why do you need to take this chart? How wide are these things? They can range from eight to twelve feet. How wide is the sidewalk? Five feet. Five feet. Five okay. Feet. So yeah, just double sidewalk, and we're spending a hundred thousand dollars just to do a study. Uh, double sidewalk. And uh, I think that what we need to do is to come up with some, a few bullet points with with our state representative. You can't go over this whole thing; they'll get lost and um, glaze over. But say, you know, here's some couple things that we think would help. The best would be for the state just to block grant the money for sidewalks, green and. Uh, uh, Greenland, New Park, so wherever we call this thing. Uh, and as long as we meet whatever state code is for the thickness of the asphalt or the cement or whatever. But I think it would be, would be good when we meet with them because here's two or three specific things that if you could change those would expedite it. But I also think, and I'm looking at our attorney who kind of puts that, it would be great. I would certainly maybe use mine because mine's probably the most expensive of what we're going through to put in a couple of hundred feet of sidewalk and what it's costing us in the time frame and uh, maybe a chart showing because I know there's the uh, you can see the the caps on the sewer pipes or the stacks so, so it's got to be going right beside it or something um, but to, to spend a fortune on and I think the whole project six seven hundred thousand uh, dollars for a sidewalk even if we weren't using state money we would still have to do the flood study to get our Corps of Engineers permits and, and all of that. So there, there's really no way to avoid the flood studies. So down well, I'll have to talk to the folks in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Ms. Adams and Mr. McIntosh. Oh, I think he was before me. You okay? Right. <coughs> so I'm watching right. out for fairness. Right. Go ahead. So we're talking about here is asking for forgiveness instead of permission from the state. I mean, we know what state regs are. I mean, we can build. There's not going to be any surprises along the way if we go ahead and get out in front and do some of the stuff and then come back and say, no, no, we're not changing. We're not proposing to violate the rules. What we're saying is that if we use our money, we don't have to have their permission for the approvals of the use of their money. Okay. Well, okay. If I can elaborate on that. What's been happening is that a, an enormous amount of the delay in construction of the projects comes because a approval for an expenditure that's perfectly in line with their rules has to get shipped back to Raleigh and sits on somebody's desk for months. Gets, yeah. Until you, you know, yeah. jiggle until you get somebody who is their boss to jiggle their elbow, to sign it and send it back. Ms. Adams, I uh, just want to, I guess, comment or piggyback on Councilmember Clark and Mac Councilmember McIntosh, in that we as city officials tell our people, you want greenways and sidewalks, we can get that, or or that's good, and we'll get that for you whether we have a bond, capital needs, taxes, whatever. But the process that we have in place right now, 
I will never tell anybody in my ward I'm going to get them a greenway. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Because as to Councilmember Clark, I might be here and I might not. And I'm talking about in person. Yeah. Because it, the, the process is too long, people. And I don't know what we do, Mr. Garrity, Mr. Turner, as being proactive, uh, Attorney Carmen. We need to move this on. We need to get somebody involved in this, some other cities, the municip municipality, the league, whatever. But five to seven years to build a greenway, I mean, it's a sidewalk. That's all it is. I don't, I don't get it. And because if you go and look at some of the ones that we have now, Mr. Bessie, you can attest to this. Yeah, some of them get a little flooded when it rains. I mean, but whose backyard doesn't flood? Come to my house and see what I got right now. But the point is, we can't keep putting it on the agenda of what we provide for our citizens when we know in reality this deal is no closer than the Beltway. Just a comment. Just for information, we do actually have the support of the league and other cities in terms of encouraging um, NCDOT and the other uh, appropriate entities to come up with standards more appropriate for greenways instead of making us build greenways according to the road standards. To the road. And um, the, the reason it initially was delayed was uh, DOT said, you don't have to order us to do that, we'll do that. And now it's a year later and they still haven't done it, so we're going back Sad. and asking again. That legislature said, no, you know, let's tell them to do it and give them a deadline. Um, but um, does anybody have any concerns about the possibility of our trying to take these shortcuts um, of uh, of doing the doing the engineering? Well, that's that's why I was asking about the the, the, yeah. the numbers involved. Um, we had to pay for mine, mine wouldn't be built. Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about the last chart that says we do it entirely oh. at our expense. I'm saying that we take, that we give staff the flexibility to come back to us with proposals that would um, spend a little bit more at, you know, compared to the total size of the project early on to cut a significant amount of time off the processing. The, um, the flood studies and the right-of-way acquisition. Um, Compared to the total cost of the projects, that's not a lot of the cost, but it's a lot of the time that it's taken to get them done. Yeah, I'd say the next, you know, it's probably too late for these current ones, but the next mm -hmm. yeah, let's make a little. Yeah, other other I'm thoughts okay with that? that. Mm -hmm. right. You've got the committee's blessing. We understand. Right. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for putting the uh, work together to uh, come up with these ideas. We appreciate it. Um, G5, please. Presentation on Winston Lake and Salem Lake Master Plans. And we have, ah, uh -huh. gentlemen. Good evening, Chair, members of the committee. Good evening. Um, Good evening. The first uh, master plan that I'm going to go over is the Salem Lake Master Plan. And the first area I'd like to uh, go over is the uh, implementation um, of what we feel we could do with uh, phase one monies. Um, these are uh, staff's recommendations for phase one implementation of the master plan. Uh, we will begin at Salem Lake with the, uh, the construction of a new warden's building and marina center. Uh, it's approximately 1,750 square feet upstairs, uh, 1,750 square feet downstairs. Um, we will look to improve the waterfront area along the frontage of Salem Lake uh, with some additional uh, walkways, pathways, um, new pedestrian circulation patterns, um, new site amenities, trash receptacles, things of that nature. Uh, we would also look um, further down in the area that we commonly refer to now as the point. The area that we, we refer to as the point. Uh, we would try to bridge the connection from the point um, over to the uh, larger marina area. Right now, there really isn't a pedestrian, uh, there isn't pedestrian access there. We would like to uh, um, complete that. We're also proposed to um, build a outdoor water spray ground with the restroom building, as well as a brand new playground for the uh, Fort Salem Lake. 
Um, there's one piece that uh, we sought to add, which was uh, pretty, received a lot of comments on it. That was adding a restroom building on the Limbo Road side of Salem Lake. Um, that is not shown on this plan. I didn't, we didn't include that overall plan, but that is part of the phase one implementation. Um, we feel that um, the signage, um, uh, various side amenities along the, uh, the frontage of the, uh, of the lake here and the installation of the new marina center that you can see here, which will include um, an outdoor decking for um, large gatherings. Uh, we'll move the, um, I guess, uh, uh, recreation staff and the um, fishing and the tackle and that, that type of outfit underneath the, uh, on the bottom level. Uh, we'll provide a, a really nice views and access out to the pier. And on the inside, we have a large area that, where we have a really nice meeting space. Uh, we look to use this piece as a, something that we can use to uh, generate revenue. Uh, we think it'll make an, an immediate impact. It'll keep the interest going and allow us to continue uh, developing the master plan. Any questions before I move on to Mr. Lake? This is a good time to ask questions about this because when it came through the first time, it was a it was a vision off in the future, and now we're talking about putting real money for this on this year's bond package. Ms. Evans. Yes. Presently, how many people staff Salem Lake City employees? How many people do we use to or have working there? Council member, currently at Salem Lake, we have uh, two full-time staff positions and four part-time staff positions at Salem Lake. And basically, what do they do? In real short, what do they do? Uh, patrol the grounds, okay. help people on the trail. They sell uh, boating, fishing licenses, boating registration, and just kind of man the facility. Okay. How many people are we talking about with what we're doing here? How many people are we talking about we're going to have to bring on? Because to man something, and this is great, but to manage and man, man this appropriately and ensure that people are safe, and we're talking larger areas, more people, more areas where sometimes there, uh, people cannot be seen or whatever, and people managing the arena center, arena center, how roughly, give me a number, how many people we think we may have to bring on? At this particular time, if we had to give you a number, uh, we feel very strongly that that number could be met with part-time staff, part-time non-benefited staff with probably two to four additional part-time staff. Okay, well, I, I, I hear you. I know it's an estimate, but I think your numbers are going to be a little larger than that. So I wouldn't hold you to it, but I think we need to start looking at that as well, uh, Chairman. Uh, as we go to these projects, whether it's this, whether it's the quarry, whether it's Union Station, whether it's the police districts, whether it's any project that we're now creating a venue that we're going to have to have people there. We're expecting people to come there. Along with the numbers of making this work, we need to look at what are our numbers going to change on the employee side. That, that's all I'm saying. I think that's a good observation, and I think the two facilities that would guarantee uh, extra staff burden, in particular in this context, would be the Marina Center yeah. and the Spray Because we don't want to get sued. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Shetland. Well, uh, of course, th this particular project is in the Southeast Ward. I know there's a lot of time and effort that went into this, a lot of citizen participation. Uh, I like the project. Uh, this is included in the bond referendum, and I believe the price tag that is put on it is roughly uh, $4 million, but I believe that out of that money, we will definitely see uh, the best bang for our buck. Now, uh, I think you bring up an excellent point, Councilmember Adams, uh, in reference to Salem Lake and, and the amount of employees that we may have to increase yeah. there. But I believe that uh, the Marina Center is probably one of the more innovative centers that we have uh, in the whole Parks and Recs uh, facilities. And I believe that that particular center will pay for itself. I mean, given the outlook over the lake, uh, the way they're trying to make it look here, I believe they would generate enough funding to be able to, to, to bring a few more people on. So I think this project, once it's completed, will pay for itself. Uh, gentlemen, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, certainly with the Marina Center, 
our staff vision was to have a facility that would uh, create demand for rentals uh, approximately year round. Um, currently, right now, in the fall and winter, you know, you can get great views of the lake. We do believe that as far as a rental facility that we operate, that this has the potential to generate rental every weekend. And a lot of it could be during the weekday because, as I think as Mr. Royston pointed out, the bait and tackle shop will actually be underneath on the bottom level. But we can go back and, and look at an operational budget and put some numbers together and bring that back uh, in the future. Yeah, I think that'll be good to have. Uh, I was just there this weekend on, on, on a John boat. I, first of all, I want to take the opportunity just to commend the, the staff uh, for the good job that they do for the citizens there. And included in your staff, you have to have somebody who drives that boat <laughs> and goes out to get people who floats too far. Uh, I, I was out with my mom and, and my wife, and we floated a little bit too far, and I didn't have the strength to muster back in, so we've got to include that in the staff as well. <laughs> I wouldn't have told you. I, I gave up. I gave up. Football days. <laughs> gave up yourself. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, I also want us to think about when we do, we're doing all of these great projects and these, these visionaries that we've had now for four to five years. I have no problem with that, but we also have to be proactive in thinking. We're also talking about a huge barn or capital needs to the convention center. Uh, we're talking about possibly something at Winston Lake. When you start talking about creating all these venues for rental, you need to start thinking about what's going to pull away from something else and how we invest our dollars. Uh, Mr. Garrity, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. If I create a new convention center somewhere down the line and I got this great marina out here center that now I've been going to the convention center for my little conference or convention but I'm going to pull them to Taylor council member Taylor's arena out here because I love it you know the view but then I also have some other places in the city that we're looking at I just need us to understand where we balance there's a counterbalance and we need to start looking at these projects now of how they will impact or affect or a ripple effect to each other. That's all. We need, we need to look at that because we can invest the dollars, but we may not see dollars. We may not even see an equal uh, Council Member Bessie, as you know what I'm talking about. There may be a downside to this. This is great for the citizens of Winston-Salem. This is going to be a tourist attraction. And, and that's why I'm saying we just need to look at the whole picture now since all of these things are going to be happening around the same time. Ms. McIntosh. Do we rank our parks in terms of usage by citizens? Yeah. Is there a numerical? Council Member, we don't rank them. Um, I can tell you the most heavily used park locations, but we don't provide a ranking. This would rank near the top, would it not? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Along with what else? Haynes Park? Haynes Park, uh, Bolton Park is another heavily used park. Yeah. Uh, Winston Lake, we think, uh, given the uh, uh, master plan that you'll see in a few minutes, will be another park that will move up quite a bit in terms of the amenities. But without a doubt, Salem Lake is the most heavily used and most diverse park in our system. And this plan will increase capacity, so we expect more, more usage? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Actually, that is my concern about the Marina Center. Um, uh, on weekend use now, uh, during a broad season, um, my sense is that it's often maxed out in terms of capacity for the, the areas. Um, adding an additional substantial draw to the location that is the most likely to be maxed out in terms of of parking and, and access facilities is going to create a problem. How, do, how are you going to address that? Certainly a good point, Councilmember Bessing. Uh, when you look at the uh, operational procedures for a facility like this, for instance, uh, we would block out certain hours in terms of being able to rent the facility. During the daylight hours, a lot of times you don't want a large group or a large gathering coming in. But, you know, at various times during the year, depending upon daylight saving times or not, the lake closes due to darkness. And by the time the lake closes, you could have the facility available at those particular times to accommodate rentals. So staff would develop a plan 
to uh, develop certain hours that the facility could be rented and primarily to minimize the impact upon the marina area and the trail in Salem Lake as well. I would suggest that that is something that we need as a part of the public discussion of the bond package and because one of the pushbacks I expect that we would get uh, with the de management development plan here uh, is from existing users worried that the additional investment in, in that facility would adversely affect their experience at, at the park. So if, if we're going to put forward this as a proposal for the bond package, I think we need to put forward simultaneously um, solutions for how we're going to avoid adversely impacting the existing very large user base. Uh, Mr. President. I believe that there will be an additional draw from the Marina Center, and I think that's good for business. Uh, one of the things that I would have uh, the committee and those at the table to keep in mind is I believe there will be a healthy balance uh, due to uh, the quarry project uh, just down the street. Uh, I think phase one for the quarry project is included in the bomb referendum as well, and that is a lookout and an amphitheater there that could help to draw uh, some of the attention away from Salem Lake. So between the Quarry Project and Salem Lake, uh, I think the two will have a healthy balance and they'll balance out. So again, I think there needs to be a policy, but I don't think that everyone will rush to Salem Lake given the gym that we have uh, with the Quarry Project. Uh, Mr. Montgomery and then Ms. Adams. As we're talking about in terms of detracting or taking away from anything, it'd be good to know um, and get some numbers specifically on uh, the actual items, uh, the programming that we have there at the lake and the numbers of participants there and what would be a potential impact, if any, on those. Because um, I am more inclined to think that if these added things will bolster um, attendance rather than adversely affect it. So that would be something that I'd, I'd like to see again is the programming and the numbers of participants that we have and some of the things that take place there. Yeah, actually my, my concern was not that it would, it would take away. drop attendance but that you've got your capacity at, at some times is already maxed out in terms of uh, the, the parking space and the facilities. A lot of what's on here increases capacity. Um, uh, I keep coming back to the Marina Center as the one that increases capacity but also presents potential demand conflicts at a level that needs to be addressed in advance. Ms. Adams. And that's what I was telling Councilmember McIntosh. I said, can you say Disneyland? I mean, you're talking about Disneyland and Florida and Disneyland, uh, California at the lake. And I mean, think about it. When I was growing up, well, you guys weren't even around, but when I was growing up, Winston Lake was the lake. I remember every Saturday or Sunday, my parents, along with everybody else I know, took their children with their Sunday dinner after church to Winston Lake. Was it packed? Yes, it was. You got to remember the times we live in now, uh, parents and young people want to be more interactive than what they are with outdoors and engaged. This is it right here. This would be the, now you got to also think now, Greensboro, High Point, we used to go to High Point Lake too. High Point, Greensboro, Lexington, King, Tobacco. All these people, when these things open, this is Disneyland. The quarry, Disneyland. <laughs> So we need to start thinking about the numbers because now it becomes, as we always say, a destination location. Mr. McGovern. And, and one last thing I'll say, that, that I think Councilman Adams is 100% is true. Um, our church, we, we do an annual um, uh, picnic that we have with the church, a cookout we do, and we, we go to High Point Lake. I mean, we, we go to the park in High Point because of the amenities that are there, particularly for the young people, the pool access and, and the opportunity to go out on the water with some of the additional boat access they have there. If we had something like this closer, we, we'd do that here. But I think there's just the amenities that are at some of those locations, as you say, is one of the things that draws us away from having it at one of the places here in terms, and even our capacity to hold as many people at a particular time. So I think it's great and I think we're looking at it, but I think there are those questions that we need to, to answer in terms of how we deal with that real potential of, of numbers that come into to the place. And these are great problems to have. I don't want people to go into a panic and think this is a reason not to do it. Not I mean, these are great problems to have, but we have a responsibility uh, to manage this thing. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Royce, I interrupted you. Um, if I may, I would like to uh, point out that we, we anticipated that when you 
it's basically introduced this new toy to the community that mm -hmm. the, the attendance is going to increase. One of the things that we did throughout the master plan process was look at the existing um, area, square footage for parking, and found that we can really maximize and get better usage out of the number of spaces. So even with the existing pavement, if we just come in and restrap it, we're able to gain 75 to 100 parking spaces, okay. as well as add additional boat parking spaces to kind of make the area a lot more usable. Um, also, the overall plan is to make sure that it, it's more pedestrian friendly so that people don't have to always drive there, that you're able to, to get there and use some, other, some of the other parking areas at the lake. Very good. And I think the, uh, the restroom facilities on the Lindell Lake side will help as well. Yes. Um, thank you, gentlemen. And uh, next up is Winston Lake Park, I believe. Okay, to begin with, I want to show you an overall view of the overall plan that was completed for Winston Lake Park. Um, staff's recommendations for a phase one will be focused in this area here, which is uh, right off of Waterworks Road in 311. Staff's recommendations for uh, phase one for Winston Lake Park, um, again, is something that we feel we could um, implement to immediately uh, begin to generate revenue. Um, what we're looking to, to do was the uh, Waterworks Splash Park or Aquatic Center, um, restrooms, changing showers, uh, guard check-in concession, picnic shelters, as well as bleachers, um, competitive diving pool with zero depth entry, which is here. Um, zero depth entry with a splash pad, um, an iconic uh, tower element, something that people can begin to see and identify with, uh, with Winston Lake, um, have a lazy river attached to it um, as, a, as an amenity, um, revamping the parking, uh, which is on the opposite side of the creek. Uh, to uh, increase parking, uh, uh, resurface uh, a lot of the existing pavement there, add, add um, a little bit of extra paving, but kind of repurpose the existing um, parking lot that's there, um, add signage, walks, fencing, uh, furnishings, and creating a bridge access from the parking area to the um, splash pad. Uh, everything that you basically see in this area here will be implemented as part of phase one. Uh, one of the things that we also included with this was a uh, signage allowance. Uh, it, can, it's going to, it could be a little confusing for people, so we want to make sure that we have the appropriate directional signage so that people um, don't get confused when they enter the site. Any questions? Questions? Uh, Ms. Adams? Yes. How many entrances are there into Salem Lake, what we're talking about creating? I know we got Salem Road or something. How many roads come in or leave that park, that into, area? Into Salem Lake or? Uh-huh, Salem Lake. Um, one, two, three. And Winston Lake Park. One, two, three. Is that including the one that we closed down or will that be reopened or is, no? Which By the golf course, there's, a, there's the road that we shut down. That's, that's not included as one of the Okay, cases. all right, thank you. Um, Mr. Montgomery. Well, show, where, show me the three for Winston Lake. You have the um, access, the current access, which is here, that mm -hmm. kind of takes you to where the uh, tiny Indians are. You have the uh, access off of Greensboro Road, and you have the Waterworks Road, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Winston Lake Road access, which is here. And I, I think that was the, the place that I think Council from Adams mentioned, because you can't access all the way back around from Winston Lake. Um, it, it goes all the way through up to Greensboro Road. What I'm talking about, if you're going in from the golf course side from Winston Lake Road, is that the one you're talking about? No. Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow this. Because I, 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 I'm only really thinking of two. I may, I may miss them. Yeah, I, I know about the right. Waterworks Road and the old Greensboro Road. I'm trying to. <coughs> I'm trying to think of the third. third, too. The access off of Waterworks Road, I mean, off of Winston Lake Road, um, goes all the way through the park around uh, several picnic shelters. Um, uh, around the lake, and it comes out on Greensboro Road. Oh, yeah. There, there, was, there was a piece of a road that is closed, um, and part of the overall master plan was to make that a pedestrian 
walk type. Walk and not a vehicle access. Where? So it's, it's two. Or it's three. We're still only seeing Waterworks Road and Old Greensboro Road. Let, let me see if I can clarify this. Okay. Off of Waterworks Road, you have an entrance into the park, which is Winston Lake Park Road. Mm -hmm. You have a second entrance off of Waterworks Road that gets you towards the Ray Agnew football field. Right. So if you count that entrance, that's your second entrance, and if you count the new Greensboro Road entrance up by Atkins High School, that gives you three. So two of the entrances you're talking about are really pretty close together. Right, they're close yeah, together, they're close yes. Together. Right, got it. And the, 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 the one that you're not counting is the one that opens off with New Walker Town, because that just goes to the golf course, right? That's, that road was, uh, council closed that road some, uh, a number of years ago after a very tragic accident involving a um, local police officer. Yeah. Okay. And the new clubhouse, let me just add this, when the new clubhouse was built at Winston Lake Golf Course, um, it was determined to allow the golfers to be able to take their carts into the parking lot. So now you have a situation where the road has been closed by council and you have golf carts that are allowed to go from the clubhouse into the parking lot. So in, in essence, they actually cross what a road that was once open. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. At some point in time, gentlemen, uh, the, the Tiny Indians football team played at the, the Boys and Girls Club on Martin Luther King back when I was growing up there. They since moved off of Waterworks Road uh, to the area that I'm looking at here. What happens to the Tiny Indians football team in this master plan in phase one? Nothing happens to relocating the Tiny Indians. They actually, if you look at the master plan, the football stadium will actually be improved and enhanced mm -hmm. uh, and will be more of a stadium kind of uh, special event center that football by the time the Indians will continue to be played there. So it's being moved to a different park? No, it's at the same location. The field is being oriented in a different direction. Next to the Y. Down to the Can you help me to see that from this map, please? It, that it's got the little shelter thing. That's the current location of the field. We 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 oriented it east west. That okay. And but it's it's still enough space to. You had a line for soccer. We're both fo football guys, so we didn't, <laughs> yeah. we didn't see it. We, we, actually, part of the proposal when we get to that point is to be able to do um, multi-purpose events there. When the tiny Indians are not using it during their season. You can actually uh, host other events there, other <coughs> soccer, lacrosse, anything else. Plus, you would end up having a uh, kind of a stadium built in with bleachers built into the hill, so you could have many. You could have a music festival or a concert there in that particular location. All right, who owns uh, the baseball field right across the street? <coughs> City of Winston Salem. So why would we? Uh, is this included into the to the referendum uh, for Phase One? The baseball field. Yes. Well, if you look, the three baseball fields that are on the right-hand side when you put in the waterworks, they remain. The area where the, uh, Mr. Rorston had mentioned about the uh, water park area, that is a big baseball field that is not currently used by uh, any of the Little League organizations. So that's the particular area that we're looking at putting the water park. I'm just wondering, is there the potential for some type of partnership between t Twin City and the city? It looks like... Uh, Indian is going to get an upgrade, and if this is a public facility used by young kids uh, who engage in sports. Why would we not include the baseball field as well? Well, uh, we have an input. We have a partnership with both uh, Twin City and with the uh, Indians organization. Uh, currently, we are in discussion with uh, Little League Baseball and Twin City. We're doing some upgrades there. So we didn't feel that that needed to be included in part of this master plan, but we are having discussions with them about some upgrades that they want to do, that they want to finance and, and need the city's approval and partnership with that. So there will be some upgrades to the baseball field, but they are not shown in this master plan. I, I'm not the councilman of the area. I, I'll, I'll let Mr. Montgomery speak, but I think they should be. Mr. Montgomery? I, I'm not talking about the baseball field. I want a uh, couple questions. When you look at the 
shelters, how many shelters are going to be added in this area? I'm trying to count them because I'm just saying in terms of some of these additional amenities, I can see an increase of desire of wanting to have some shelters. And I see one, but I'm, I don't, is that the only one that's added there or everywhere you see that kind of brown thing, is that a, uh, a shelter? That's an, that's a, that, that, that particular shelter is actually part of the aquatic experience. It's not a typical, one of your typical picnic shelters. Directly across the, uh, mm -hmm. on the other side of the creek, this particular structure here would be a multi-level shelter. It's something unlike we have in our park system now, whereas most of our shelters are one level, where this one will be a series of steps, possibly three levels, so that you can have various picnic tables and be able to have some nice views out from that out into the, um, into the park. Okay, um, and the additional question was actually more so in terms of when we're looking at, I know this is phase one, I know we have the other things on, on the other phases that we would um, like to do, but as we look at those enhancements around the area, there's one thing in particular that I think would, and is not in phase one, but is in phase two, that I don't know how we could do it or if we could potentially do it, but particularly the pier on, um, onto um, Winston Lake. Um, if there's an opportunity for us to be able to at least do that part of it, because I think that's just an added amenity that could just help, even if you don't do the other things that are there until you go into the next phase, just being able to add the pier out or across the water, how that could, again, enhance some of the things that are there. One of the things that um, I looked at when we when I put together the, what we felt we could do with phase one, um, looking at, we, we had, we've begun to investigate the cost of building that type of floating dock shelter out over the lake, as well as adding a restroom, a separate restroom facility out there for the, for the, fish, uh, for the fishermen. So um, we're looking at that and we may be able to find some savings from the bridge. We don't think that it will cost what we, what, what we were quoted. So we'll be able to, to take some savings from that and, and do some other things around the uh, fishing areas at the lake. All right, and then back to circling back around, is there anything in, in our plans at all, not necessarily in terms of what we're looking at mass plan, but anything at all of any additional improvements that we're thinking down the road or, or at any point to those baseball fields or are they meeting the current need that we have now? Uh, there's some, we have some, um, some drainage issues. Eventually uh, the infields could be, uh, the infield material could be replaced with a, a higher grade material. Um, the outfields could, you can, you can actually look at going with an artificial turf. Uh, we haven't begun to kind of look at how that, want to go maybe look at some different models where some other communities have done that and where they've been successful. We looked at several of the uh, county's facilities and we've begun to kind of get some costs in terms of what it would take. Uh, but it's, there's some equipment upgrades and it's just a little, what we want to do, we don't have the equipment to kind of maintain them at, at that high level. Uh, but we are looking at uh, putting together a package, and if it's not part of a bond referendum, maybe it could be um, a capital outlay or a capital um, need later on. And my very last question is, are there concessions in this area in terms of what we have here? There's a proposal for a new concession with the, uh, in the aquatic area, yes. Okay. Um, I had a question. Uh, are any of the walking trail improvements in the park included in your proposed stage one? We're going to, um, we're going to investigate creating a walking loop um, around the lake and try to, one of the things that we heard from public input was that they wanted to open up the opposite side of the lake for fishing um, and, and walking activities. So we're going to look at opening that area up um, and possibly uh, creating some type of soft surface walking path around the lake. Um, it may or may not be included, but this is something we're looking at even before uh, this phase one. Yeah. Well, before the phase one even, I, that, this is, that's one of the improvements I've been asking for uh, for several years. Um, uh, in, in fact, the last time I went through the park on, on foot, it seemed to me that with a very minimum investment, you could actually open up some of the trails that are already there. You know, the, the, the hardest part was finding the trailhead. You know, from the um, uh, existing shelters uh, and a little bit of investment and some signage would point people to some great you know, low-impact walking opportunities um, and that's 
that's in demand. Um, so please look at what you can do to accelerate that. Mr. Phelps. Just to touch on the baseball field again, sure. uh, I know you know I wouldn't let that go so easily. Uh, I, I feel like it should be included in phase one. Uh, it is just directly across the street. It is a city-owned facility, and I don't think that cost should be handed down uh, to the nonprofit that probably loses money every single year and works with the youth in our community. Uh, I feel like this needs to be included in the package. I'm not jumping on anybody, but I think the Twin City does a good job, and, and this field could use the improvements. Now, how we maintain them going forward, we can have a conversation about that. But it's right across the street. I feel like it needs to be included, members of the committee. Mr. Clark. I'm looking at the big master plan here. Mm -hmm. A couple of comments. One at the very bottom, is that a nine hole golf course at the bottom? <laughs> that is a disc, disc golf. golf. Okay. Um, I would say, first off, I like the use of the water, particularly at the lakes. You put it in some additional boat docks and fishing and things like that. People like beaches, et cetera. I guess my main comment on the Winston Lake one is you've got, if I'm counting correctly, three different pavilions, and it's hard for me to read this writing, but there's one that says Eagle's Nest Pavilion at the bottom, and I'm on the one with the, the lake to the left. Then I've got the Pier Pavilion, is two, and then I've got a building that says Special Events Center. Um, and I've also got another outdoor it says Grand Lawn Outdoor Seating, and I've also got that at the baseball, I mean at the revised football field. I've also got a outdoor type thing. Uh, two comments there. One, I, the comment expressed previously by Ms. Adams, I just see all sorts of operating costs here, and, and we don't need to, to kid ourselves. All this grass has got to be cut, cleaned, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but unlike Salem Lake, where we basically have one building, here you've got three, and I'm just questioning whether or not you need that many pavilions that close together and that many amphitheaters that close together. Uh, my experience with amphitheaters, they look great on paper, but they're rarely used, and I would use as an example the one that's within easy walking distance of here beside the Solstice Center that I don't know. We used to do a few things in the summer there. But I, I would say of the 365 days in the year, 95% of the time, there's no, nothing taking place there. Uh, and it does get a little run down and moth-eaten, I think, because of that. So uh, I like the plans overall. I would just question, and I, and I, I don't know about the disc golf. Uh, I just know how way underutilized the golf course is now. And I just want to be sure that we build facilities that people are going to use and uh, I will say I'm particularly excited about the, the water area because I think people like water. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Montgomery. Um, I think uh, there's some reason in terms of as we look at this. I think when you're looking at particularly some of the things on the water, if I remember correctly in attending some of those community uh, meetings that we had, it was about some of these positions open up some views on the water that currently are not open. And so some of these positions pretty much give some different uh, angles and um, opportunity access that are not currently existing. I know for one portion in terms of the dam portion that's there, uh, that there were some photos that were shown of that and that currently you cannot see that, but when you see it in, in pictures, it's beautiful, but you can't, there's no access to it now. So I think some of the things that are added there just kind of help bring in a, a, a different view and I think those are things that people want to see and I think would help uh, in that whole attracting people um, into uh, the park and increasing that um, attendance and access to those who are coming into the park. Um, and again, on the uh, other parts, and I hear, I think, again, most of the recommendations that we have here, you know, was built off of that community input that you had in terms of what people wanted to see um, from across the city. People came to those meetings to see what they want to see and where we want to make those um, Investments. I'm not taking anything away from the baseball field side, but I think the substance of it was mostly built off of what what people wanted to see that investment. I don't. I think there's some things we may need to do, but the initial portion was based off of, of much community input um, that I was a part of, much of as well as other people who came, not just from the East Ward, but people from across the city, uh, participating in that dialogue. 
uh, to get us to the point we're in now. So I think it's a, as we looked at it, even at the same lake one, I think it's a good thing. Uh, we just got to deal with, again, uh, what else comes with putting these things into place as we talked about operating costs and additional things that have come with it. Um, looking at the first phase, uh, if there are other things we can do with what we're currently looking at, by all means, let us take a look at it, but not to a point that it would obstruct any other things that we're, we want to do. A lot of uh, suggestions. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, Great job. Anything else? If not, um, we appreciate it. Thank Great you. Great job. And I believe that completes our scheduled agenda. Is there anything else that needs to be brought before the committee this evening? No. <laughs> All right. No, I can think of. Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. We're adjourned.